It's the Kyle Hyman Show on Redeemer Radio. You have to understand that, that these a lot of these pieces are not intact. Huh. Well, this is going to horrify listeners, but in truth, that breaking up of these triptychs and, and other things that had multiple parts was most of the time not accidental. It was for monetary reasons. You can't talk about art history without seeing the impact Catholicism has had on art and the impact that art has had on Catholicism. It's time for our monthly art history lesson with Charles and Amanda Shepard from the Fort Wayne Museum of Art. Well, here we are back at the Fort Wayne Museum of Art, surrounded by great pieces of art, like everywhere. It's it's like we're just in a, what, like a little lecture room. Yeah. Just all kinds of art here. Yeah. We should be surrounded it's by everywhere. beauty at all times. Yeah. Even the podium is a work of art. I know. I, this is the first thing <laughs> first I said when I saw. walked in here. Like, that podium is so cool. Yeah. A little light fixture ahead of you, too. Yeah. yeah. Is that a custom thing? Uh, I We've had that for about 10 years, and it's moved around the building. I think one of our designers found it for us, but we call it Sputnik. Sputnik. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hovering the, over our space. The bulbs are, are very interesting. Well, if you're going to have a meeting, why not do it in style and beauty? There you go. Well, what are we talking about today? We're talking about a 15th century triptych. And a triptych is a work of art that has three distinct elements, kind of three separate panels or sections. Um, Usually, it's a two-dimensional work of art. So in this case, we're talking about an altarpiece That was painted around 1475, 1476 by the French artist Nicolas Fromont. And he was commissioned by King René of Anjou to make this altarpiece for a church at Aix-en-Provence in southern France. And he combines Old and New Testament scenes and then in the center panel. And then on either side are two panels. And so... The panels would have been uh, hinged together so they can kind of create like a rounded kind of window opening experience on the altar. On the left is the king and then on the right is his wife. So they are painted in their garb, 15th century garb, surrounded Mm -hmm. by their nobility and their uh, the people on their court and they're shown praying to the center altarpiece. And the way a triptych during this time period would have been organized is that the center panel is always your most important panel. Mm -hmm. That's where the real subject is. And yet, generally speaking, because they're commissioned, you need to be able to include who commissioned them, who paid for this. And so you're able to use the two panels left and right to include important people from the time period of when it was commissioned and also show them as being properly spiritual by showing worship to the center mm-hmm. center panel. And just so people have a sense of what a triptych like this would have looked like in size and scope, this is 10 feet tall and 13 feet wide. Hmm. So this is, this is a, indeed a big altarpiece. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So in the center panel, I'll paint the picture for people. The title of the work is Triptych of the Burning Bush or the Virgin Mary in the Burning Bush. So Uh we have the Old Testament burning bush combined with God incarnate through the Virgin Mary. So Mary is sitting in a burning rose bush holding the infant Christ. She's on Mount Horeb, which is the mount the mountain that Moses was called to in the book of Exodus. He is shown in the bottom right, taking off his sandals. The angel of God told him to do that. And the angel is depicted as cautioning him to take off your shoes and sort of looking at him with like a kind of an admonishing look on the angel's (laughs) face. Like, Uh sit down, take off your shoes. And prepare to be astonished. And prepare to be (laughs) astonished. (laughs) Yes, and... It was not quite as common at this time of the early Renaissance. So he's coming out of the medieval period and into the more the Renaissance style, which would have been more perspective, more realistic figures, more contours in the figures and everything. 
it was not as common for Old Testament scenes to be emphasized. It was it was a lot mm. of New Testament scenes, but he is combining the Old Testament story of the burning bush with basically the basis of the New Testament is God incarnate. Mm-hmm. So it's a wonderful juxtaposition of God as burning but not consuming his creatures the closer they are to him. Mm-hmm. And with Mary, she exemplifies this. She's overcome by the Holy Spirit, but she remains herself. And to place her in this bush is such a brilliant move to exemplify the God of the Old Testament unites with God incarnate in the New Testament. So bringing together those two stories sums up the Bible in this triptych. Well, and and small detail, but I think it's also important to note that Mary's holding Christ the child, Uh and Christ the child is holding a mirror, Uh which is reflecting he and his mother to his mother. Mm -hmm. So it's it's further, and and it's like underlining, showing the truth of that they're in the burning bush, and yet they're protected. Mm -hmm. At at first when I saw it, I thought he was holding a picture, but Mm -hmm. then I saw a description saying that it was a mirror, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. holding a family photo with your family. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) It's kind of like a little inception. Yeah, Yeah. this is us. And and maybe that could be read like the Holy Spirit, like the endless reflection of the Holy Spirit Mm. with Jesus the Son and that, you know, the constant reflection and revolving of that image back and forth. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't find a lot of research on what that symbolized, but that that seems to me like a reasonable conclusion. Uh, the angel also has an interesting detail. Um, on a breastplate, the angel, you, you can't really see it in the image we're looking at, but if you zoom in online, that's uh-huh. an image of Adam and Eve on the angel. Hmm. And so, again, the Old Testament is... Uh, we, you know, we're always reminded of original sin, and the reason for Jesus Christ is original sin, this rescue operation <laughs> to, to save Israel. And, you know, Moses was called to the burning bush with his flock with instructions to save Israel from Egyptian captivity. And Jesus, again, is called from heaven uh, to come into the the world of mankind to save the whole entire world. Mm -hmm. So that small inclusion of Adam and Eve is to remind us why all of this is happening in the first place. It's because of the fall. Mm -hmm. I want to mention, too, that (laughs) Moses has a flock of sheep, and there are a couple of black sheep there. And uh, if you look closely at one of them, one of the black sheep has red eyes, and uh, hmm. Again, sin is included. The demon sheep is, is included in the flock. Uh, there's all sorts of things we could read into that, but there's so much detail in this and so many little clues that are really interesting to the viewer. Well, and that's indicative, too, of the, the shift from the earlier way of painting, style of painting, into the Renaissance's more highly articulated, much more realistic, much more depth of field, so that you can bring these things to life, really, rather than the medieval flattening of things. So, in a sense, in a medieval work, they're clearly not supposed to be any illusionistic. It's just a flat depiction. Mm -hmm. This is supposed to bring the depiction to life by being illusionistic. Mm -hmm. Remember, too, that artists... So, so Mary is um, wearing a beautiful dark blue robe, and and the folds of her robe and veil are cascading out around her. And she has the most beautiful, kind of regal looking clothing. Mm-hmm. And then the angel and Moses have beautiful folds in their clothes. This is one of the ways artists prove their talents. Okay. So it, it was a way to show off, like kind of like a, a, a guitar solo yeah. <laughs> or drum solo. <laughs> this is this was the Renaissance version of that to show how and as somebody who went to art school for painting, this is this is really difficult to achieve. Yeah. The folds are really difficult to look realistic and look beautiful. So that's really on display. And then the perspective behind the mountain, because this was painted for a French church, it's the town of Avignon hmm. in the background. 
Well, and the things that you just noted too, on a personal level, were important to uh, Fremont because he was a, a highly esteemed member of what they called the Second School of Aragon Painters, and this piece is his masterpiece. It's the mm -hmm. best he'd ever done. Mm -hmm. So he's put it out there that any fold, any wrinkle, any glow, I can do anything. <laughs> and so it's, it's a gorgeous piece with a lot of meaning, but it also on a personal level, it has a lot of meaning for Vermont to say, I'm not number two or three, I'm kind of top of this school. Yeah. There is one challenge that we should bring up that he and any artist would solve in this way is how do you paint an angel? Right. An angel is a spirit. An yeah. angel is a fearsome thing. It, you know, in the Bible, you automatically conjure an image of a figure entering your room or coming uh -huh. down from heaven with wings uh -huh. and speaking to you. <laughs> and they almost always start with, do not be afraid. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which should give us a clue True. that maybe these aren't just, you know, childlike booty with right. wings and a little <laughs> cloth around them. So you're kind of forced to personify the angel. This is a very figurative, realistic work. It would not have been a good idea for him to just paint a bright light or mm -hmm. a strong driving wind. He had to be more explicit than that. And so we see in you know, throughout most of our history, the angel depicted as less fearsome than they really were. Uh -huh. And they, and then they, and then it kind of, they become more and more innocent and they become little like children, like fat yeah. chubby children <laughs> flying around or like a nice lady with a beautiful robe and uh -huh. wings on. And so he solved that challenge by painting a figure angel. Mm -hmm. Not a ch child. No, but a nice lady. Yeah. <laughs> nice lady. So now these trips, you mentioned the panels on the side would fold in. It looks like they're about half the width of the, the center panel. So do they fold over on itself to close it up like for a Good Friday or something like that? I'm not sure how that was done. Charles, do you know? Well, yes. Generally, it gave you two, two things. Practically speaking, yes, you could, if you had to transport, you mm -hmm. could fold it up and the backs, now these were all would have been painted on wood. So if you fold it hmm. in on each, each side on the other, it's a very safe way to move the painting, number one, or to close it up if there was a day that you needed to close it up, a holy mm -hmm. day. And yet another part of this device is that by having them able to not be f totally flat against the wall, but come out, you're kind of putting your arms around the paintings, putting his yeah. arms around you as you stand before it. Mm -hmm. So it's more inclusive, I guess would be a, a word I would use. So it's practical and it's inclusive. And students sometimes will say, well, why didn't they just get a bigger piece of wood <laughs> yeah. and just do it that way? Well, yeah. they certainly could have gotten a bigger uh -huh. piece of wood, but that, that's what tells you this is because they could have and didn't, this is very intentional. Right. They want this to work in certain ways. And, and I'm sure there were times, just for the practicality, you would close it up and protect it. Unfortunately, though, for altarpieces like this, they've been disassembled since they were created or used. And, and you'll find them scattered in different museums around the world. Mm. Like this panel is in England. This panel's in Russia. Hmm. This panel's in France. And because of the provenance of those pieces and the rightful ownership of certain parts of those, whoever holds a part of that altar piece is not going to want to give it away mm -hmm. to just to put it back together. Some, you know, some have, but yeah. you know, it's understood that if you own it rightfully, if, you know, whatever French king or noble person bought it and then sold it to this person or gave it to that and ended up in Italy rather than its place of origin, most museums aren't aren't going to want to give it up. Yeah. So we have to understand that that these a lot of these pieces are not intact. Huh. Well, this is going to horrify listeners, but <laughs> in truth, that breaking up of these triptychs and, and other things that had multiple parts was most of the time not accidental. It was for monetary reasons. Mm -hmm. I may have bought this legitimately, but I see if I were to resell it or if my dealer were to resell it, ah, I 
depending on how you count it, I've got three paintings, not one for sale. Yeah. You know, and, mm -hmm. and the thing is 13 feet long. Who uh -huh. wants a 13 foot painting? <laughs> so that's where a lot of your splitting up happens. I mean, sometimes it is accidental in the sense that you could have a, a chapel destroyed and things come apart, uh, unintentionally and, and don't find their other pieces. But we bought a very small, but very lovely black and white print abstract about a month ago by an artist, a woman artist that we've never had in the collection before, Joe Bear, a kind of a minimalist. And I was so happy to get this nice little piece by Joe Bear. And the price wasn't huge, but it wasn't tiny either. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then doing more research, I found out it's actually one of 16. The original work was 16 pieces and somebody broke one of these pieces off and sold it separately for probably the same price as the 16 sold for uh -huh. originally, according <laughs> to my research. So it, it tells you. Yeah. A little about people. Yeah. So are triptychs still common? Or was there an era for the triptychs that kind of came and went? I don't think there is as common. Or it's always been kind of a rare thing. Uh, well, I, I think in these times, from the Renaissance probably up to the 19th century, they had a purpose. And for altars? Or for, for altars or for situations that. that there's some reason why the three panels would culminate in more meaning. Mm -hmm. Now, in the 20th century, I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say in the 20th century, it's kind of a cool device. You know, I can remember, uh, you know, being in art classes and people talking about diptychs and triptychs and think, oh, that's I did a diptych. Oh, uh -huh. you did a triptych. Like, <laughs> how cool is that? And there's no meaning at all. But we're we're uh -huh. thinking, this kind of cool. You, I could do it all on one piece of paper, but by doing it in, on three, I, I've got three frames. I take up a little more wall space in a show. I'm really sophisticated. Yeah, that, that's I know, right. Yeah. I well, you think you're kind of <laughs> on the inside track somewhere, you know? Because you've had some in here hanging up that yep. would be multiple pieces that... Our, well, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're looking at a, a six-piece uh, kind of metal painting where the pieces relate to one another, but they're distinct. I think there is a big risk, Kyle, when you make something with multiple pieces that it could be exploited. And so an artist really needs to be careful and uh, intentional about why they're doing it mm -hmm. and to be really purposeful in, in keeping it together. And then there is always the risk that it's going to get broken up and sold or given away mm -hmm. well and, and the piece that you're just referring to by dorothy gillespie on the wall a lot of the imagery is carried over mm -hmm. into the left or right panel so it tells you it could have been on one right sheet mm -hmm. um it's not that those edges don't match up in some sophisticated way but i think in dorothy's case and i think she's a tremendous artist long deceased but i think in her case she's part of that generation I just described that, that, hey, I've come upon this concept that I could do a piece and have it in, be in multiples and that has some real presence on the wall. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I, I think she's probably right. Seeing the six pieces has more impact on me than if it was all on one piece. Well, in the case of Mary and the Burning Bush that we're talking about today, it's a way to separate the scenes right. that like, the king and his wife are included in the artwork, but they're separate from the scene. So there's a respectful distance with the gold framing. And then even in the center panel, there's this very ornate gold frame surrounding the biblical scenes that they're part of the artwork, but they're praying in front of the center panel. So the viewer doesn't, get the sense that the king and his wife thought so highly of themselves that they were going <laughs> to exactly. paint themselves right into the biblical scenes. I was hanging and, out with Moses that day. Right. Yeah, like, you know, I'm so holy. I was there. Right. I, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then they're also depicted in their courts with this really fascinating and uh, mysterious red drapery coming down from the ceilings that signify their royalty, but kind of act as a curtain between them and the biblical scene. So the triptych works 
beautifully to not only from a practical standpoint of standing up on the altar, you need the angled sides, closing it up if you wanted it to, transporting it. It's got its built-in protection, the you know, the back of the the painting. And then also artistically, the patron and his wife and the court are part of the artwork, but they're separate from the scene. Mm-hmm. It's a beautiful piece. It's a wonderful piece. Yeah. I, the colors, I feel like, are just really cool colors. Yeah, they are. Like, the, it's, it's got a modern aesthetic to it almost. The, and, but the crimson really just... and <laughs> There's always in these court scenes, there's always a little dog in the corner. <laughs> With the twisty tail. <laughs> With the like, twisty yeah. tail. I don't think that's natural. Yeah, no, that's not. <laughs> but it's so. a little flourish of yeah. the tail. And then Moses has a little dog. And then two dogs are looking at each other. Mm-hmm. So. Oh, yeah. There's a, you always <laughs> want to look out for these little humorous aspects. And then even on the side where the queen is, there's these funny looking, uh, hmm. I don't know if they're little devils. And the, the bishop there is kind of casting them down in a way. Uh, but they're these little naked, <laughs> funny looking men um, kind of staring up at the Well, the, the bishop people. has his eye on them. He does. They're not yeah. going to get away with too much. <laughs> I also point out that Moses' dog is the bigger dog. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think that's important to know. But yeah. it's very like red, black, white, and green. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like it, it's got a color scheme to it. It does, yeah. All right. Well, this is the triptych of the burning bush from Nicolas Froment. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, as always, I'll have the image for it in the show notes if people want to go check that out at kylehyman.com. you find a link to it if you don't want to search it on your own. Uh, but what's going on at the museum? We have a lot going on at the museum. We have a wonderful exhibition of uh, historic Indiana paintings done by artists who painted outside of their studios. So that's up right now. And then a really moving show of photography by Larry Burroughs. He was a uh, he documented the Vietnam War for many years and he actually was killed in Vietnam trying to, hmm. to capture an event. Uh, so and, and all the photos were purchased by Life magazine and published by Life. So we have purchased a set of those photos and are re-exhibiting them here. And we include also war ephemera from local Vietnam soldiers. Oh wow. Mm-hmm. Very cool. It, it's it's going to be a very powerful show. And Burroughs, among all the war correspondents of the Vietnam War, had a reputation of being the most selfless. And not that he wasn't afraid, but he was going after the picture n- no matter what. Hmm. And there's several photo sequence showing a downed helicopter. The pilot appears to be dead. The co-pilot is running from that helicopter toward the helicopter that Burroughs and the gunner guy mm-hmm. are in. And that fellow is escaping this downed helicopter. The gunnery sergeant is asked to go over and check on the pilot. Is the pilot alive or dead? And so he just jumps out of the helicopter and races toward the, the pilot who's downed. And Burroughs is right behind him. Burroughs not even supposed to get out of the chopper. Yeah. And he's right behind him taking the pictures and he wants to see. And – it was one of the stories that his fellow photographers used to love to recount because none of them would admit they'd ever do it. <laughs> yeah. You know, but Burroughs is going to get that shot no matter what. And they did, and they actually saved the downed guy, even though he appeared to be dead. They got him out of there and they saved him. Huh. And he turned out to be from Indiana. Oh. All right. Well, people, stop by this, the museum, mm-hmm. downtown Fort Wayne, or fwmoa.org, fwmoa on social media. Mm hmm. Fort Wayne Museum of Art. That's right. Initials. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Charles and Amanda. This has been fun. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. If you'd like to support this show and other great audio programming, go to RedeemerRadio.com and click Donate. And until next time, remember to leave room for the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm.